So once again, welcome everybody tonight. This is uh, fun to be back in the Zoom world. Fun for me to not have to get on a plane to see all of you and, and just uh, look at my screen here. But again, we want to make this interactive. So we'll use the yeah tissues for sure. Uh, uh, get your tissues ready. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, very few times have I sat in a program and bawled uncontrollably and uh and arthur has a way of getting to such a deep level and uh there's very very few people if if anybody that can connect like arthur so i'm so glad that you guys are here tonight and hopefully many of you will be at either the wine country or the orange county uh full day of of this but you get a treat tonight before we get started though I'm going to ask Karna and Dwayne just to give us a little what's going on in wine country and in Orange County beyond even Arthur's upcoming class. So you can kind of let people know and maybe beyond again, beyond coming to Arthur's class, there might be another class that you want to see. So we're going to start with Karna. Just uh, tell us what's going on in wine country and what people can look forward to. Hi everyone, my name is Karna. I'm the Vice President of PPWC, um, the local affiliate in California in wine country under PPA. Um, we are so excited to host Arthur next Tuesday live in person, uh, Tuesday, November the 8th from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, there's an assured wine break somewhere in the middle there. Um, we even even tomorrow we have an event in person. It's a panel discussion. Um, gosh, we have so many things on our calendar coming up. Our very last, um, yep, Kimberly held up her wine glass. Um, we have our very last image competition of the year on uh, Tuesday, November the 15th. And we hope that you'll join us. So our website is PPWC dash online.org and i can write that in the chat awesome awesome and Dwayne, what's going on in orange county welcome everybody coming up in orange county tomorrow night we have our fourth image competition of the year the running for who's going to be best of orange county is right now within about four points of each other so it could be anybody's game we have Arthur Rainville tonight at teasing what he's going to be talking about with our group live and in person on November 10th. Since we have Southern California commutes, we will be starting at the convenient hour of 10 a.m. Because we don't want to hold Arthur back on any of the fantastic information, we'll be taking a short dinner break at about 6, full of our glasses of wine, and moving on to a fireside chat that evening. Bring your questions, bring your bodies, let's hang out in person. Also want to make a note for those of you who want more of Arthur after this evening and can't wait until the 8th, take a look at the Profitable Photographer. Take a look at the YouTube channel with Lucy Dumas. Uh, she has just posted an interview she did with Arthur about a week ago. So check that out. And I want to make a special thank you to both PPA and PPC, Professional Photographers of California. Without their help, this event could not have come together. So thank you guys very much. And for those of you that don't know who PPOC is, we are the Southern California, one of the Southern California affiliates of Professional Photographers of America. You can check us out on PPOC.org. and take a peek at some of our upcoming programming that's already falling into 2023. So with that, Brian, go ahead and take it away. Excellent. They had lots of great events and, and I'm excited. I'll get to come down and be um, with the Orange County group for Arthur's class on the 10th. So I'm going to be in the area and uh, that's going to be a great day. So Arthur, we uh we had some nice nice chats uh not only on the phone but uh we got to spend some time together for the past couple of years in in connecticut and that's where i had a chance to see even deeper programs i've seen you speak at ppa i mean i don't know how many times i've seen you speak but i think each time it gets richer and deeper and more meaningful or maybe 
I'm just more aware that I need it more. And, uh, and so I just have to say that I'm so looking forward to the content, uh, not only for maybe how it will impact me professionally, but personally as well. So, uh, I know everybody's in for a treat when, when they get to hear some of your content. Before we get started with questions from Karna and Dwayne, is there anything you want to kind of start out by telling the group, Arthur? What, what does your heart say right now? And a couple of you guys convinced me to do this, started with Dia and Tim. Uh, and it, it's meant a lot to me. Um, I not only have missed it, I feed off it. And it feeds my spirit and my soul. And it's feeling that's what I'm supposed to do is hang with you guys and share thoughts. So this is very special to me. Thank you. And hopefully we'll collaborate on a lot of good feelings. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you know, that, that feeling of, uh, like you said, you, you thought you were retired and we had a little bit of that conversation in Connecticut and, uh, I hope, I hope in some ways you never retire, but, um, I know that this will be a, uh, a great event coming up. So I'm going to start with Dwayne. Dwayne, why don't you ask Arthur kind of maybe one of the first questions to get the ball rolling. Arthur, you've done this for 50, 55 plus years. You've done a couple of lectures. Over that time, how has these lectures, how has this teaching, how has your photography process Helped you become who you are today? Um, you know, we were talking about this a little earlier, too, together. Uh, there's some such similarity between all of us. Uh, so I started out as a young hotshot going to all these kinds of lectures and seminars and all of that stuff. And the more you gather it in, the more excited you get, and the more you experience, and the more you do. And it's just that wonderful upward spiral. Uh, there's bumps along the way, things that don't work out the way you'd hoped and expected and stuff. But you go through all these stages, the stages of learning technical things like lighting and posing and how to do a wedding and all of that stuff. And you go through all of those stages. And it's almost gleeful. You're not really, I mean, you're going through it in real time, but you're just, I don't know how to explain it other than you're just going through your day-to-day -day motions of life in a wonderful way. And hopefully it's always building and being successful. Every once in a while, if you're wise enough, you get a pivotal awakening. Most of the time, I think I probably missed a lot of them along the way, but I did catch a few and it changed everything. For instance, I grew up in this business. Uh, my father was a portrait photographer his whole life. And I presume that's what I was supposed to do. And I was happily doing that and stuff. Uh, And then somewhere along the way, I fell into the fact that I loved doing exactly this, having lovely conversations and, and sharing thoughts and ideas with people. And it turns out my mother was a school teacher. It never occurred to me that I would love to do that. And so the day that that happened, it was a pivotal moment. I realized now I was given two gifts of things that I like to do. And so I had to build this new world of being somewhat I'm still a photographer and somewhat a speaker and stuff. And it grew from that. Um, there were times that one aspect of it took more attention than another. Um, 
And the whole business life of 50 years, it's like there's the highs and lows and, and you have some wonderful successes and some moments you have to pull yourself out of the, the pit. So uh, it's been a great life. It's different today. And uh, I think we'll all have, you'll all get to this point. You'll all arrive at this uh, time when you're not being active as much. But what's interesting is you, you are thinking of it all on a whole different level. Uh, so my father at the end was had Parkinson's and he was in a nursing home for seven years. And I'd go up every night after I closed the studio and spend time with him and his mind was still as sharp as ever right till the end. And he would recall sessions he did with people and stuff. And it was wonderful chit-chatting. And part of that <clears throat> was a pivotal moment. Because <clears throat> I didn't realize how much that mattered. To me, doing a session was more about the experience for me than it was for the person I was photographing. Yet from his perspective, he thought of it from their perspective, what he was doing for them and how much it meant to them. I like to tell the story how I, I mean, it was a small town. And so I got young hotshot. I went off to school and got a whole bunch of new ideas and everything else. And I came back and I knew how to do fancy lighting. He didn't know how to do fancy lighting. It wasn't a big deal to him. I knew how to do fancy posing. He didn't do fancy posing. But people loved his portraits. And I got frustrated. I said, oh, my God, wouldn't you know? Here I am, Mr. Cool, in a town full of people who are not cool. They don't get it. And it took me a lot of years to figure out that because they didn't know of all the fancy lighting and posing I did, the reason they loved his pictures is because he didn't think about it or cared about the fancy stuff. He cared about them. And in the process, he got the most honest and pure and genuine expressions that they loved when they saw the pictures. That's what they loved about the pictures. And they loved the experience of being, having it done with him. That was a pivotal moment. I approached making portraits completely different after I understood that. So yes, you still need all the rest of it to be to the high level of professionalism you want. But there's this other whole place and that's the personal connection with every person who's in front of your lens. So that's a long story to get to where we are, but. I'm hoping that I have this really connected personal feeling with each of you that are gonna show up at our workshops. Um, I've built this whole thing around that. This is about you and your why. So Arthur, we were talking yesterday and you said something about that the stories are the answers. And I'm just curious what you mean by that. Obviously, I've collected a lot of my stories over the years. But you each have stories, too. And every person who sits for you as a subject has stories, too. Every wedding that you photograph, those people have stories. Everybody has their stories, and people care about their stories. And the more you can make that connection and find something that is of value to them to talk about, the more genuine you're gonna get expressions. Um, years ago, when I was teaching at New England School of Photography in Boston, I had three students from China and they had the damnedest time talking to anybody to photograph. So all they could say was, okay, one, two, three, and they would push the button at three, no matter what the expression, it didn't matter. That was when they were taking the picture. If that person wasn't ready and smiling at that point, too dang bad. Uh, occasionally they did all right with people were laughing, but the connection you make. And that was a skill that I never got to learn 
when I was going out and listening to speakers. I learned lighting, I learned posing, I learned lots of stuff. I didn't learn the people skills that I needed. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. Uh, and Brian's a master of that too. It's what you say and how you say it, but then it's how you mean it and how you feel it. So it's about their stories. I've already got so many notes and so many thoughts um, from some of the things you said that, you know, the pivotal moments in the, and their stories and, and uh, already, already good stuff. I want to send it over to Dwayne. Dwayne's going to post up a, a poll. There's, there's three questions and maybe you can ask them, um, Dwayne, so people can kind of fill that out um, before we keep going and then make sure to use the chat to, put your questions in here for Arthur and, and then I can, I can call on those. So you should see a box that popped up with some, some poll questions and uh, go ahead and, and read over them and ask them, Dwayne. So the first question in the poll is asking whether or not this is your first time that you've seen Arthur speak. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I try to get to know everybody. I also see a few new faces, so that'll be fantastic. Uh, the second question, because there's a lot of different professional photographer organizations, so is simply asking whether or not you know about professional photographers of wine country or pro professional photographers of Orange County or any of the other PPA affiliates. And lastly, probably the most important question, if you like what you hear this evening, let us know whether or not you would like more information on how you can come and see Arthur in the next couple of weeks, either in wine country on November 8th or in Orange County on November 10th. So while you're filling that out, I've got a question for Brian. Yes. So Brian, if you could um, sit and have a chat with a younger you, what advice would you give yourself? So how much how much time do we how much time do we have right now? <laughs> Go ahead and answer, Brian. If you carry on too long, I'll pull I'll pull out the hook. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing is, um, and we kind of talked about this earlier about the younger Brian was so certain of of things. Um and maybe that's where when you were saying, you know, Arthur, you felt like you were the hot shot. The, the younger Brian maybe had a little of that ego, too. And and so as time goes on, I mean, even this pivotal moment um, and I'm, I'm going back to something you just said, uh, I had tons of pivotal moments and I didn't appreciate them in the moment. I saw most pivotal moments as something that wasn't going right or something that was not going according to plan. Yeah. Now, those of us that have been around a while realize those are the pivotal moments where we need to slow down, listen, observe, and actually actually look at it. So those are some of the conversations I definitely would have with uh, the younger Brian to be aware of pivotal moments. Um, there's, there's sprinkled so many throughout that now in hindsight, I can go back, but I miss so many opportunities to, to learn from them that uh, at least now through maybe a little bit more awareness, I can, I can see them and, and catch up a little bit. But if there's, if there's a regret and you can't do anything with, with regrets, but it would be that I missed I missed some pivotal moments along the way that, oh, I wish I could, uh, I wish so I could have back. There's still always going to be more to have. That's what's cool. Yeah. So, well, but now the perspective is to appreciate them and look at them as a gift versus I used to think, why is this happening to me? How can I do away with this? My perspective is, is 180 degrees. But unless we give ourselves time to recognize it you almost need to whatever it is you take your and make your appointments on whether it's on your phone or it's still your old calendar whatever you almost need to write an appointment for yourself to do a little reflection 
every other day or week or once in a while so that you can slow down enough to see if you recognize missing something along the way. Um, it, and it might be something as simple as a conversation you were having with a client and it got sidetracked one way or another and you missed a clue of something that would have been important to them. Um, you know, all these years I've always used the definition of a portrait. A picture is of somebody, but a portrait's about somebody. That's your job. As a professional, your job is not just to do a fancy map of the face. I did that for a lot of years and I made them fancier all the time, but they were just fancy maps of faces. I need to make a portrait that says something about that person. Now that can come out as where they're, where the portrait is in the environment. It can be, you know, that's an obvious and things. It gets more subtle and more difficult to do it just purely through expression. And, and it could be that the expression that you capture is not relevant to anybody, but the person that's either the subject or the one that the portrait is for but it's the behind the eyes kind of thing that triggers that about. And uh, so that's the depth level of, I think what we as professionals have to do for people now, make it not just fancy, make it more personal. And that's one thing that you're gonna cover in the class um, that I know when I've seen your other programs and how you, how you do that was, was really refreshing um, again, it's not the just one, two, three, click the button whenever the, uh, you know, you get to three kind of, uh, approach. Yeah. I like the three count though. It's cool. <laughs> so, uh, Dwayne, why don't you go through, uh, the results here? It looks like this is uh, first time to see him live 63%. Whoa. That is pretty amazing. We were having some discussions with Arthur going back as far as July when we first talked about putting this idea together. And one of those pivotal moments was whether or not Arthur felt like he was still relevant these days. I think this shows that you're still very much relevant, Arthur. We're all relevant at times. <laughs> this time <laughs> I'm... I, but I felt them only relevant to my eight-year-old granddaughter, but that's okay. Um, we're gonna cover a lot of new things because, because I had to put this together. I pulled together a lot of new ideas and things. Some things like invisibilism and whatever that is, but <laughs> Dia down in the corner there coined it. And I've, I've worked on it ever since. And it's, I've got some good ideas for you. Part of the point of all of this, and we're gonna cover some less than traditional lighting and, and posing and setting and, and, and aspects of street photography are gonna get pulled into it. And I mean, we're gonna build this huge, it's almost a holistic whole world approach towards this. Um, but the point is to make you make images on a higher level than just good lighting and good this and good that and to make it more unique and special and personal for you and then for that subject in front of you. So we're gonna build a, a whole scenario that I suspect you haven't heard some of it before. That's because I just made it up. <laughs> Fresh and new from Arthur. So Dwayne, why don't you ask the next question? So the workshop is called Creating from Your Shadow Self. Cool title. Uh, for those of you that know me, I'm not exactly the sharpest tool in the box. What does that really mean? What is the workshop going to be about, Arthur? So all you have to do is look over your shoulder and your shadow self is always there. Um, it's kind of your your silent spirit in a sense, I guess. Uh, and it's very powerful, but it's not very strong. And it gets 
shoved to the background a lot because your conscious self has got to feed the kids and make the money and make the new portraits and go to the wedding and be responsible and all of the stuff that's on the surface all the time. But there's aspects of you that are your nature. And most of the time, we're making pictures that are somebody else's nature and not yours. And if you can find a way to connect your nature to your work, you will make more meaningful work, meaningful to your subject, but meaningful to yourself too. So your shadow self is things like um, understanding how important, for instance, atmosphere is to you. It isn't to some people, but it might be to you. How do you build that into the work that you do and stuff? So we're gonna craft this whole thing based on your shadow self. So do we need to know what our shadow self is before we get there or will you help reveal it in us? I mean, we're gonna work on that. I'm betting you won't know even after you leave. I bet it's going to take you some time to figure this one out. But we're going to give you some formulas, and uh, formulas is much too cr crunchy a word, some thoughts about how to find what's important to you and translate it into your work. I'm a little bit confused, Arthur. Um, my time as a photographer has been about delivering a product and you're talking about something I'm not sure how to find in myself. This sounds really uncomfortable and kind of frightening to me. It's not like you're under pressure here to produce anything other than to appreciate things about you you probably don't take the time to do, uh, to appreciate the way you see the world, the way you see people, feel about people and stuff, the way there's just so much about you that you probably don't spend time finding out about. So that's kind of what we're going to cover on a lot of it. It's kind of tutti frutti. It's kind of mixed fruits and, and a few glazed nuts along the way. So is, is that kind of also finding out what your why is? Uh, why you do what you do? So you and I share a similar why in that we feel that we are compelled to gather knowledge and share it with people. Bob does it all the time too, this stuff. Um, if you're a teacher, you are anointed by some higher power to be that teacher. If you're a portrait photographer, you were placed on this earth to leave a tender trail. You were anointed to do that job. Uh, you have to recognize it, maybe discover it and then appreciate it for what it is. It is your nature, it is, it is just critical. And, and it can manifest itself then in your work, if it's your commercial work, are just your personal fine art work, landscapes, everything else. I'll use Bob as an example. I know enough about watching and looking at Bob's, we're talking about Bob Coates from down the road. Bob, where are you down the road from now? Oh yeah, you can turn your sound back on. Uh, I'm in Sedona, Arizona. So I've seen enough of his landscapes and his images and all the stuff he creates to know exactly that that is his, he doesn't do soft stuff like I do. I understand exactly his nature based on the work that he's doing. He brings it all to bear. It's his use of color, it's his use of composition. It's all of that thing. It's all a drama that he brings. It's in here. That's where it starts. So that's the stuff that we have to talk about. Awesome. Karna, what question do you have next? Mm. Hasn't it all been said before? What do you say to that person? 
Um, absolutely. Everything has been said, everything has been done. Possibly by the crowd that's right here. <laughs> um, it hasn't been said and done exactly the way we're going to talk about it. Just like each of you create, we could put the exact same subject in front of every one of you, give you the same light, same everything to work with, and leave the room and leave you alone and let you do your thing. Everybody would look at all the images afterwards, and while there'd be some similarities, because you, you photographed the same subject, they would all have a different flavor. Recognizing your flavor is a key piece of this, because you will do better work. You will be more enthusiastic to sell it and everything else if you understand your flavor. So... Yeah, we're going to talk about all that stuff. So so I, I want to just throw one little thing out there. Um, you were just talking about appreciating your own flavor. Uh, do you think that too many people look for what the flavor of the month is, so to speak, and try and copy it versus having enough courage to find their own flavor? Um. Maybe I'm thinking of the lens of image competition where it seems like if something does well, that becomes the creative style I choice. Know. I know. Picasso had a quote that said, good artists copy, great artists steal. And the trouble is they steal and it's fine if you're copying and stealing to learn, to learn a new way to light, to learn a new way to compose, to learn stuff like that. Um, Renoir, I mean, for God's sake, he was Renoir, but he wasn't always Renoir that we know. He started out in the Louvre copying famous paintings because people wanted copies of famous paintings. In the process of doing that, he learned a lot of stuff. He chose to embrace some of that for himself and some of it he chose not to. He started to learn all of that stuff. And in the process, he was building his collection, his collection of ways to do things, of things that he liked, of things that he didn't like and stuff. And he was crafting this image of where he was going with his life. All the great artists in any genre, whether it's painting and photography, dance, I don't care what it is, have done this. You have to have a starting point. You have to learn skills and then you build and a pivotal day will come when you say, wait a minute, this is how I see it. This is how I want to render it. This is my thing, my style, my vision, my whatever you want to call it. It's a pivotal day. I never saw it coming. It happened though, and I recognized it shortly there afterwards. Um, we'll talk about it, but it's... Um, so yeah, that's what it's all about. It's all been said, it's all been done. We're pulling together a whole bunch of examples. We're gonna talk a lot about um, art. Uh, and so I started early on, maybe because my mother was the school teacher and I just started looking and studying. Of course, in those days, we actually, they were so thrilled. They had an Encyclopedia Britannica that they went into hawk for to put in our house for me to go by. And I lived in those pages. And every month, National Geographic would come in and she and I would sit and travel the world and stuff. Uh, in the process, I was building me, whatever. Everything I remembered, everything that mattered, everything started to become me. Uh, and that's how visual artists do that. You just grow me. So all of a sudden, me is a conglomeration of a lot of things, how you bring it together. So we're going to look at a lot of different art, different people and things. Some of it will light your fire and some of it won't. We're going to look at a lot of different things like lighting and stuff. If you've learned lighting from Tim Maya, God bless you. You got the best foundation on the planet, but we're gonna play at some different kinds of lighting things. 
somewhere along the way, it's about discovery. You have to make your own discoveries, but I'm going to give you some starting points, that's for sure. I know in the, the Connecticut class, um, you showed so many examples of some of the great artists that I had never really um, experienced. And then you showed a picture uh, of, I think it was outside of your window of a street, kind of up, up a hill with cars on it. Yeah. Um, and I could see some of the inspiration, but it was uniquely you at the same time. I mean, that that image that you took out of your window uh, has kind of stuck with me. And uh, Bob, Bob basically echoes the sentiment that we're the sum total of all that we have ingested. Yeah. Do you have another question for Arthur, Dwayne, or Karna? I, I do. I, it wouldn't be fair to hold this session and have Arthur at our disposal without asking the iPhone question. And the iPhone question being, what do you think the future of our profession holds? Where do you think it's going? Does, does the photography industry have a will of its own or is it something that's going to go away? And I think the quote that you used earlier when we chatted was the will of invent inevitability so the will of inevitability quote comes from martin luther king and he was speaking about well the world he spoke about and the stuff inevitability of things our world of inevitability um it's funny you mentioned the iphone because i've always said it's not what's in your hands that makes the picture that only affixes it for the moment, but that's not what makes the picture. And yet photographers have always been crazy. We, we, we're a crazy bunch. We always have to have the latest and greatest and newest. And if I get this camera, if I get that light, if I do this, that, my stuff's gonna get better, better, better. All right. Um, it's not what's in your hands that makes the picture. It's what starts here and spins here and all the way you bring it together, that makes the picture. So, as we move forward, and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff because AI is going to change this industry for sure. It's doing it already. iPhones are doing it already. It's just unbelievable where it's going to go, but that's okay because it's all the inevitability of, well, I bring it back to a quote by John Nesbitt that I've always used. The more high tech we become, the more high touch we desire. I don't care what happens and how technically amazing the world gets of photography, but the reason that people have a portrait or have you photograph their wedding or any of those things is because they need that behind that fancy face, emotional connection to the expression to the person in that picture. Now they're getting it on their iPhones. Ever since the forties, there's been the steady progression of snapshots, people getting better and making it easier. Kodak kept making the cameras easier and stuff. And people now that with phones, I mean, the portrait mode in the iPhone is pretty incredible, right? What have we got that we can say, okay, we can do, but you can't. Exactly what we've been talking about. The way that you can connect to your, to your subject and make the expression, make the portrait that says something about them. They won't do that part. They can't do that part. Most of us can't even do that part, for God's sake. That's the skill to learn. Now, there's no period at the end of that sentence. There's a comma. As Brian knows, just because you can doesn't mean you're gonna sell it unless you can explain it. You have to let them know what it is you're doing. What is the value? You've got to explain it, show it, make them feel it. And we're gonna go through a whole bunch of sessions 
the nice thing about this, Brian, is we're going to have time to physically do some sessions. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is the stuff we're going to get into. Yeah, I think that's the exciting thing is um, we actually will have time to dig into and see it and practice it and understand it even more. So uh, that's that's pretty exciting. Okay, Karna, what question do you have now? Well, Arthur, you were mentioning that you hoped that there were three types of attendees at your workshop next week. And I was just wondering who you envisioned. So I always remember taking a class with Jeremy Sutton in LA years ago. And we got there and there was eight people. And on this end of the room, there was this guy that has been in Photoshop since the day Photoshop one came up. I mean, he knew almost as much as Bob Coates does. Mm -hmm. And on the other end of the room was this woman who came with a big unopened Mac Pro box. She had never even been on, opened Photoshop. She didn't know what a file was. She, so here's poor Jeremy Sutton. So got somebody on one end and the other. And he lost her when he opened his mouth and he lost him the minute he opened his mouth because it just hope. So it always affected me. And I said, I have to make sure that there is something in this day for everybody. Um, some things will land, some things won't. Some things will land on you later after the fact. But I envision that there are some of you that will be there that are making your living full time or at least in part time as a professional. So the things we need to talk about are not only making the picture special, but they need to be saleable and you need to know how to sell. We're going to talk about, for instance, Addison trusts that I used to do. So there's the aspect of you making images for dollar bills. Then there will be some of you who that part of it is not your life. Whistler, McNeil Whistler, was, um, and we're going to do a couple of in-depth looks at some of these guys, but Whistler could care less about making a living with his art. He's the one who had the phrase, art for art's sake. He was a purist. And there will be some of you that are making, looking to make images to a higher level, but not necessarily to have to sell them, art for art's sake. And there may even be one of you or so coming that making the money and even making the images is not nearly as important as much as what you want to get from me that is personal about celebrating your life and all the stuff that really matters down in the bottom. So that's the three kinds of people. I kind of am building this around the word poverty. Poverty, right? So when you hear the word poverty, what do you think about? Think about people that don't have enough money to eat, to live, whatever, that kind of poverty. But there's other kinds of poverty, right? There's poverty of imagination. There's, there's artists of all kinds that that's not how they're wired. That's not part of their DNA that they can invent their own new wheel. And they need a new wheel sometimes. It's, it's the next jump start to move on. Poverty of imagination. And there's poverty of passion. But you don't have enough devotion and energy to make this work, to make your work better, to make your business better, to make your life better. How do you find, where do you find the passion? 
Because being in the poverty of any of these kinds is terribly painful. It, it just will freeze you in your tracks of life, never mind work. So we're going to try to address poverty <laughs> in this whole day. That's my thought. That's pretty amazing. I wrote down the, I need a new wheel. Um, and uh, I, ha I have lots of post-it notes with, with Arthur's phrases on it. Um, and so the, I need a new wheel, but the courage to be able to invent a new wheel um, and not be scared that the wheel I have is good enough and the wheel I have is getting me where I want to go. Uh, I can spend probably a lot of time thinking about this. So I'm excited even to dig in on, on the, the poverty thing. I've never, I've never thought of poverty, but one dimensional. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Well, part of what stops us from everything is fear, right? Uh, fear is probably the number one thing that just freezes us in our tracks. And what is that fear? Fear that my clients won't like it. Fear that PPA won't like it. Fear that my mother won't like it. Fear that I won't like it. Fear stops us in our tracks from trying something new. How do we get past that? So I got lots of good ideas for you how to get past that, but it's not easy. Nothing's ever easy. What picture would you make if no one was going to critique it in any way, shape, or form. I mean, I remember the first time I, I got all excited. Do, I'm doing abstract now. And the first time I did one, I couldn't. I was so excited. I really loved it. It kind of sucks really bad right now. But my first one was cool anyway. I thought at the moment, you make something new and you can't, you can't wait to share it, right? I mean, that's what we do. We, we, we're all sharers. So you go and find the first person you could find. And I, I go running out to my wife and, she, and I said, look, 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 look. She says, no, oh, that's nice. Nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, my God. It's only nice. We're terribly emotional people, us artists. Everything we do, we're hyper over everything. Uh, how do you get past those roadblocks or disappointments? Because this is all a big piece of this. It's a bigger, deeper piece than just learning a new lighting or any of that stuff. Yes, all of that's important. This stuff is a bigger piece. How are you getting through your life, your business, all of that? That's, Brian calls them soft skills. I call them selfie skills. How can you get yourself to be your best friend? to make this all come together, make it work. Yeah, there's going to be so much to unpack. And, you know, one of the, the things, like you said, there's going to be three, maybe three different kinds of people there. Um, it will be interesting what each of us take away from it as well. And then how we use it. Um, that can even be the conversation after the conversation. Like, because you'll be saying virtually the same words to all of us, but how we interpret it and how we then internalize it will be maybe completely a different message. So in some ways I'm excited to be in the room with others as they're kind of sharing these moments and then we can have, have a, a, a little chat about it. Uh, so that's yeah. going to be exciting as well. We're going to do an afterglow. An afterglow is after we've had our little, uh, whatever we're having at the end of the day, get together. And it's partly regrouping and re-hitting on some key points and things like that. And part of it's a final shot at connecting with what we're supposed to. So yeah, it'll be an interesting day. Hopefully it'll be better than the old fashions that we had at the uh, Chinese restaurant in Connecticut, Arthur. <laughs> We're using one of those right now. I'm supposed to have my jammies on you. That's true. I'm it is. It is I'm a little a later on the East Coast for you. I'm uh, here. Yeah. There's a couple other East Coasters on here, so 
they're uh, they're feeling the pain too. Does anybody have a question for Arthur? Feel free to unmute and uh, and ask. I didn't see any direct questions in the in the chat here, but um, while you're here, does anybody want to unmute and and ask a direct question? Rebecca, why don't you unmute and ask? Hi, Arthur. This is Rebecca. Um, I think this is going to be my third time attending your. <laughs> You're I recognize you and Tasha and, and Jim and yeah, a lot of people, yeah. Yes, and I just, you know, you already made me ball my eyes completely. I already told Kimberly and Dwayne, um, how would you like us to prepare or what do you, would, would you like us to do before coming to the in-person day? Um, hmm. It's not like some of the things we did at, West Coast School, where we had days and days to do. This is kind of cool. And I, I've mostly been doing a couple hour lectures always. And then we did West Coast School and that expands this way, but I've not done an all day workshop like this one in a long time. So I've kind of got it ready for you. And um, yeah, you but really, I want to be ready for you. Yeah, you really don't have to do anything other than come with an open heart and mind and um, and anxious. And really that's all you have to do. You, you're not bringing a camera. You don't need to do that. Um, we've got some notebooks for you and everything. We're ready for you. <laughs> Bring tissues. Oh, oh, we have that covered. Yeah. You just use your sleeve for God. <laughs> I learned that from my grandfather. Uh. Okay. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too. Thank you. And for those in person, we're going to have a couple of small surprises when you get to the workshops. So if you're worried about crying, you'll definitely be covered. Huh. Sounds like a, you're going to have blankets for everybody. Get at the covered part. Okay, bring your own whoopee. For those that made the mistake of not wearing your pajamas tonight, you're welcome to wear PJs, G-rated to the workshop. It's a casual, comfortable day. <laughs> Arthur, you would mentioned art for art's sake, and you've also used the phrase art for heart. Are these the same? Are they different? How are they related, if at all? So basically for 50, <clears throat> 50 years, all I've talked about, I've, every single time I've ever talked anywhere, it's some different, but some of the same, some different, but always with the same theme. I've never varied theme in all these years. And that is the power of art and heart to make your work and your business and your life what you want it to be. I've known so many photographers over the years that the art part wasn't important. They got technically amazingly proficient at posing and lighting and all that jazz. But the pictures were empty, devoid of anything more than pretty, pretty. Uh, then I've known lots of photographers that are very, and I was, guilty as charged for the longest time. Uh, made images that were very nice, but devoid of any emotion on their part or my part. The combination of the two is an absolute guarantee of success. Now you gotta pull together some of the business stuff Brian talked about and everything, obviously. Uh, we're right back to where we were talking earlier. Something has to be different. You have to make work that the folks with the iPhones every day can. How are you gonna separate that? Part of that is the translation that you give them. You cannot presume just because you create the next Mona Lisa, anybody's going to know that it's the next Mona Lisa and appreciate it for that. You have to be able to explain that to them 
in ways that they understand and can appreciate it and accept it and take it to heart. So there's a big picture here that we have to build out as we spend time doing that. But those two elements make it more artistic than they can create themselves on their phones and make it more artistic <laughs> uh, is pretty much a successful formula. And everybody for years that have bit into this have made it their own. And I guess that makes me feel good. So looking forward to this. Um, I know it's late for you, Arthur. You're uh... You're three hours different than most of us West Coasters here. And uh, maybe one last call to see if anybody has questions um, specific for Arthur. Here's one. Uh, Sherry, why don't you go ahead and ask the question? Okay, uh, Arthur. Uh, it's a twofold question. One on the, on the equipment, I have to disagree because like it says in my question, ask Dwayne, some of my stuff should be in museums. <laughs> but my uncle once said, um, treat every, every person who walks through that door like a friend. And once you have the contract signed, treat them like family. What is your perspective on that? Um, how can I explain that simply? I guess I don't even think of it as family as much as I think about, well, let me back it up and explain it this way. So Brian was talking about this image that I have that is out my window here. There's been a few new ones since Brian, but um, I live in New Bedford, which is a small city halfway between Boston and Cape Cod. It was the old whaling center of the universe. It's where Moby Dick was written and all that stuff. And it's still the number one fishing port in the country. You uh, saw always live in the country, but we moved down here because of grandkids. So anyway, my we're in this old factory that's a loft. We have a loft and I look out up the street and there's a lot of triple decker houses and things like that. And especially during the pandemic, it was really important. I think most of us in the, the portrait end of this, the wedding end of this, that end of it, more so than commercial and stuff, but we're people, 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 people. Um, I know when my father retired and moved to Cape Cod, he had a really hard time adjusting not to be around people all the time. So I look up that hill and I don't know anybody that lives up there, but that's humanity. And I feel that connection to humanity. I need to feel that connection. Um, I'll tell you a great story when we get together. I spend my time now going to the grocery store and talking to people. But I don't get to see you guys very much. So that's what I do. I go into the grocery store and I make people talk to me. <laughs> I haven't been thrown out yet, but it's been close a few times. And I treat every single person. I don't care age. I don't, I don't care anything. Every person that crosses my path matters. I, I just have that connection with humanity. And I think it makes everything that I do, whether it's this program, whether it's portraits I make, whether it's just a conversation you and I have on the phone, whatever, it makes everything better because I feel like I care about you as a person. Uh, so it's my foundation. It's really my starting point for everything. Okay, I appreciate it. I perfectly understand what you're saying. Yeah. 
I think during the pandemic, we all felt that, you know, it was really tough being isolated in the pandemic. Um, and we did Zooms and it's not the same. I mean, this is great, but it's not the same. Uh, we need to breathe the same air. We will have different conversations. The information you will receive will be different. Um, everything's different face to face, in person, breathing the same air. It just is. If you have an idea, and psychologists and everybody's figured this out, and you're spinning this idea in your head, right? And you really think it's cool and you're gung ho with this idea, and you write it down, all of a sudden you think of it differently. Spinning in your head, you can only think of it so much. For some reason, it only goes so far. The minute you write it down, put it to paper, not the typing it into that thing, write it on paper, it changes. The minute you speak out loud, even if you're only talking to the mirror in yourself, it changes. The brain, the part of the brain that connects to um, what you want to have happen, the right side of that brain, not the left side, it's the production side. The right brain perceives things differently and by speaking and by listening and by writing, it's taking that information and dealing with it different than if just if your left brain spins things up there. So we will all be better when we get together. <laughs> I, I com completely agree. It's going to be uh, great when we get together. And um, Karna and Dwayne, I don't know if you have any uh, follow-up questions, but after uh, after this great conversation, I know everybody's excited that we'll be able to be there in person. Hopefully, if you're not going to be there in person, you'll uh, at some point get to see Arthur. I know there's a tiny bit that, that he keeps saying this might be his last one. We might have to keep pulling him, pulling him out of his, <laughs> his retirement until every single person that wants to see him can see him. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Marcy had a really good question in the chat. It just popped up late. So I don't know if you want to take a Yeah, look Marcy, go ahead. Hi, <laughs> sorry, I was muted. Um, I just wanted to know, Arthur, that at what point in your photography career did you realize that there's a difference between technical skill and connecting with your client on an emotional level to create an experience rather than just a portrait? Um. I got it in bits and pieces. I didn't recognize some of it when I got it along the way. I recognized it later, but not in time. Um, probably my first memory of realizing there's more to this than just pretty pretty. It was in 1965, I was marching and photographing Martin Luther King. And I got tons of great standard old photojournalism kind of pictures of Martin Luther King hiking down the road and the people around him and all that stuff he's supposed to do as photojournalist. And I looked at all the pictures afterwards and I'm going through them and there was one picture where he was sitting on the bandstand with other people who were about to speak and other people were speaking and he was just sitting there. And he was surrounded by thousands of people. But he was all alone. I could see in his face, he was all alone. He was feeling totally alone. It's not a very exciting picture, but it was the right picture. 
to make at that time. That was about him and his emotions and everything he was going through at that point. That was probably the first time I realized that you can actually show something in a picture like that. And, and I guess once I started realizing it, I really started looking for it. And it wasn't for a lot of years before I started really working for that to happen. And I got some more good stories like that for you, but it's a gradual thing. Uh, I think we get impatient when we're young and we want to learn this and we want to learn that. We want to grow up business. We want to do this and that. And that's all great. It's a piece of the puzzle. You now it's time for another piece, probably the most important piece because it'll mean the most to you and to others. Well said. Well said. Well, I think that's a, a great stopping point for tonight. I know, Dwayne, you have uh, a follow-up, though, as well. And, and I think we'll end with, uh, with what Dwayne has here. Okay. Dwayne, you were talking about Arthur and Karen. Arthur, we talked many times. And... I remember driving when I got the call. And despite what was going on then, we immediately called or got in touch with Karna. And the questions about the idea of even planning this started bouncing between Karna and Dot. And she was asking, can we do this? Not sure how many people know of them because you've been fairly quiet the past few years. And the statement I made was, I don't care. It's Arthur. Arthur has something that he needs to share, and we have a responsibility to make it possible to share that with the photographers in our circles, the people that we are involved with. And I am glad that we have another opportunity to see you live. I am glad that for the people that choose to attend, I'm excited for what they're going to get out of it. And my God, there's been a lot of conversations between you, Brian, Karna. Karna, what are the feelings you've had with putting this together and where we are at now. That is, um, I have a lot of big feelings. And I mean, simply put, I just, I literally can't wait for Sunday to come when I get to pick them up from the airport. So I'm, I'm starting with that, but I can't even believe how, how wonderful Arthur is even just getting the chance to talk with him on the telephone. I, Hi, Arthur. And it's really nice to um, get the chance to even see you. This is the first time I'm seeing you uh, live, and this is a weird fake live. But I'm I'm truly so excited. This, this can't come at a better time for me personally. That's a total selfish thing to say out loud. I'm really thrilled that you are coming out, that you are venturing outside of Massachusetts and that you're choosing to come to us. And I, without tripping over my words a little bit more, I, I'm just so excited. I cannot wait. Well, one of the things, Karna, you said was uh, we were, uh, when I was there, you know, earlier in the year, we were deciding where to go out to dinner. And I think we were like, I'll have a Diet Coke and should we go get tacos? And then the next conversation was the most meaningful moment uh, and a conversation about Arthur and how we don't know how we started talking about Arthur from I'll have a diet Coke and should we go get tacos? And then you said, Tim Meyer made the same kind of comment about Arthur, like two days later and how those dots connect. So there does seem to be using your words, Arthur, um, pivotal moments that happen. Um, and so we're super excited that some pivotal moments kind of came in all kinds of conversations 
and now we're basically a week away. Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for spending some time with us tonight. Uh, hopefully many of you will be at the events and, uh, and if you're not able to, I hope tonight you learned some, some really deep stuff that, uh, will you'll ponder on and, uh, Keep asking those questions. Keep being curious. Keep uh, that understanding of what you're creating is so much deeper than the lighting and the posing and the the hard skills. And keep digging in on the heart skills, as again, as Arthur ta talks about them. Stop. All right, everybody, take care, and uh, we will see you all soon. <laughs>